Here's everything you might have missed in The Legend of Vox Machina, Episodes 1 through 3. Five years after Vox Machina's final adventure in Critical Role's Campaign 1, the gang is back together for their very first animated series in The Legend of Vox Machina. On Friday, Critical Role's highly anticipated animated series dropped their first three episodes on Prime Video, and they're jam-packed with an vomit, violence, and Easter eggs to satisfy any kind of Dungeons & Dragons player. With deep cuts from Critical Role lore and sly references to the history of Dungeons and & Dragons and so much more, there's plenty of Easter eggs and hidden details just waiting to be discovered in this show. Especially if you're a diehard fan of Critical Role or tabletop RPGs. Now we're going to break it all down for you in just a moment, but to do so, obviously we kind of need to spoil what happens in the first three episodes of The Legend of Vox Machina. So if you haven't seen them yet and you're worried about that sort of thing, well leave now before it's too late. Uh, hello? Yes, excuse me? Ah! <laughs> Thank you, much appreciated. All right, let's get into it, shall we? Let's start with one of my favorite running jokes in this entire series thus far. Much like every Marvel movie used to feature a Stan Lee cameo, rest in peace, every episode of Critical Role has a Matthew Mercer hiding in plain sight. Now, for those of you who don't know, Matthew Mercer is the dungeon master of Critical Role. He's voiced countless NPCs, both major and minor, over the course of the group's adventures now over three campaigns. And while Mercer voices his fair share of characters in The Legend of Vox Machina, there are also background characters in each episode modeled after his real-life appearance. In episode one, Matt finds himself on the wrong end of Scanlan's stream of consciousness. In episode two, we find Matt transporting some particularly heavy barrels of ale in the town square, and then in episode three, a Matt is gainfully employed as the weapons check clerk at Sovereign Uriel's Keep. So fingers crossed we'll keep seeing Matt's pop up in each and every episode, and we'll finally learn if this is just one hapless guy or a legion of identical siblings. Moving on, in episode one, while the Sovereign confers with his advisors about what mercenaries to send to slay this fell beast terrorizing the land, one of the deceased groups mentioned are the murder hobos. Now that should be a term familiar to anyone who's played D&D with the ethos of shoot first, ask questions later. It's a colloquialism in D&D referring to characters who attack everything in their path, caring only about loot and experience rather than actual role playing. And this is usually to the dungeon master's chagrin and almost always to the detriment of the overarching story. And Anyway, none of that really matters because Vox Machina is on the case and they're more like loot goblins than murder hobos if we're going to be pedantic about it. Now, our introduction to Vox Machina is another classic D&D trope, starting the adventure in a tavern, which quickly escalates into a full-on bar brawl. During the battle, Grog cuts off an orc's hand and asks if he can keep it. Now, as longtime Critical Role viewers may remember, Grog found a number of loose body parts inside the bag of holding when he emptied it, including an orc head and a mystery arm, so clearly, this is the beginning of an absolutely disgusting collection. Later on, when Vox Machina goes to introduce themselves to the Sovereign, you may notice a familiar design on the door and windows. In certain frames, it appears to be a representation of Critical Role's D20 and Sword logo. Inside the Sovereign's audience chamber, Vex has what appears to be a premonition of danger, and this isn't spidey sense, rather it's primeval awareness, a ranger class ability from D&D 5th edition. It lets her sense when aberrations, celestials, dragons, elementals, fey, fiends, and undead are nearby. And in this case, as we find out, it is a dragon, her favorite enemy, but she isn't quite sure who or what is triggering it. Lastly, in this episode, when Vax performs a simple sleight of hand coin trick for the child in town, the kid asks if he's a wizard. Unfortunately for that kid, if he wants to see Liam O'Brien voice an animated wizard character, he'll have to wait for The Legend of the Mighty Nine. Moving on to episode two, I want to focus primarily on the contents of Gilmore's glorious goods, the shop full of all manner of mystical artifacts, magical items, and for our purposes, Easter eggs. One of the first items we see is a stuffed red weasel just sitting there on a shelf. This is a reference to Sprinkle, Jester's beloved pet weasel from campaign two. Now, if you forgot about Sprinkle, that's okay because Jester usually did as well. We also see a leather sandal in a glass case, and this is a particularly cool piece of real-world D&D lore. As revealed by Titmouse CEO and executive producer Chris Pernowski during Critical Role's Tavern Keeper build video, D&D co-creator Gary Gygax couldn't always make a living off his beloved role-playing game. Before he could make enough money from D&D full-time, he worked as a cobbler to put food on the table. And when he finally realized that he could make enough money from D&D to quit being a cobbler, Gygax stopped making a pair of sandals midway through. That singular sandal, the so-called Sandal of Gygax, now passes from keeper to keeper each year at GaryCon, the Gary Gygax-themed gaming convention held each year in Wisconsin. And now said sandal has been immortalized at last in The Legend of Vox Machina. 
That's not the only item of power in this scene though, because behind the sandal we see a metallic sphere sitting in a stand, and this bears a striking similarity to the heirloom sphere from Critical Role Campaign 2, which is better known as the Happy Fun Ball, not to be confused with Scanlan's Beads of Love. Beads? I've never once huh? seen you- Ew. The Happy Fun Ball is a powerful magical item that contains multitudes, which is all I'm gonna say for now if you haven't caught up yet on Campaign 2. Now in the foreground we see a skull that bears a striking resemblance to Marisha Ray's Campaign 2 character Beauregard. But who knows, maybe it's just another monk of the Cobalt Soul with a similar haircut and way less skin. And speaking of skulls, we also see a large Triceratops skull on one of Gilmore's shelves. Now this feels like a reference to Campaign 1, Episode 31, The Gunpowder Plot, in which Scanlan polymorphs himself into a Triceratops. Now only time will tell if we see that particular move play out in The Legend of Vox Machina, but it might just give him inspiration in the meantime. Now last but not least, perhaps the best easter egg in this scene is a copy of Tusk Love. The smut novel Tusk Love was a recurring reference in Campaign 2 and told the tale of the half-orc Oscar and Guinevere, a merchant's daughter, who entered into a particularly saucy romance. The cover here depicts Oscar and Guinevere as Ford and Jester, Travis Willingham, and Laura Bailey's characters from Campaign 2 respectively. Now, I'm sure that's just the tip of the iceberg when it comes to actual Easter eggs in Gilmore's Glorious Goods, so if you spot any others, please let us know in the comments below. Moving on, we come to another recurring bit that plays out in both episodes 2 and 3, Three, we learn that Vox Machina's real arch enemy is the Humble Door. It's such an enduring trope that Door Trouble has its own page on the Crit Roll Stats website. In episode two, we see the team struggling to open the door to Krieg's house, and in episode three, they're almost stymied by their wooden foe when Lady Allura arrives to invite them to dinner. And finally, that brings us to the grossest Easter egg of the series thus far, because hidden in Brimscythe's hoard is a troll d and while this seems like a random disgusting item at first, it's actually a reference to events that happened prior to the very first episode of Critical Role ever. This wretched appendage wound up in the team's bag of holding for quite some time, and apparently now it's in Brimscythe's stash. Now, moving on to episode three, you can see a banner depicting a number of cows. And this is a reference to campaign one, episode 26, Consequences and Cows, in which the group disguised themselves as bovines to lure a giant bird that's terrorizing the countryside. Later on in the episode, when Percy spots the Briarwoods, we get a version of the insane anime character face trope. In many anime series, when a character is about to absolutely lose it, you often see a close-up of their face from a slightly elevated angle as the camera pushes in on them and the character pushes past their breaking point. When Percy sees the Briarwoods arrive, it feels like that's precisely what's about to happen. Next up, when Vax is going to split off from the group and the team decides on a safe word, they decide on the word Chenga. Now this is likely for legal purposes because the actual word they used in the campaign was Jenga. Now, while on his stealth mission, Vax's belt turns into a snake to distract the guards. Wearing a tiny eye patch, this is most likely a visual gag referencing Snake Plissken from Escape from New York, or maybe Solid Snake from Metal Gear Solid, who's inspired by Snake Plissken himself, so let's go with the former instead of the latter. Now, another subtle detail in this episode is when Silas is battling Grog in the middle of that pool. You can see that Grog clearly has a reflection, but Silas does not, given that he is a vampire. You know, in case that whole drinking Vax's blood wasn't enough of a giveaway. And last but not least, much like they worked in Grog's iconic I Would Like to Rage line into the fight with the dragon, here we get to see No Mercy Percy in action when he tells the Briarwoods driver Desmond, you fool, your soul is forfeit. Mostly his fingers were forfeit, if we're being honest, but I'm sure his soul is as well. Anyway, folks, there you have it. That is everything we spotted in the first three episodes of The Legend of Vox Machina. New episodes will roll out every Friday on Prime Video, but if you want to go deeper into the world of Vox Machina, you can watch the entirety of Campaign 1 over on Geek and Sundry's YouTube channel. And if you want to learn more about how the proverbial sausage of Vox Machina gets made, check out my interviews with the cast, which I'll link to in the description below. In the meantime, though, tell us what do you think of The Legend of Vox Machina so far? Did you spot anything that we missed? <laughs> Oh, thank you very much. Let us know in the comments below, and for the latest and greatest in the world of pop culture, stay tuned to Nerdist.com.